Welcome to Follow Your Curiosity, where we explore the inner workings of the creative process. I'm your host, Nancy Norbeck. Hilary Webb describes herself as a cultural anthropologist, author, and mixed media storyteller with a focus on theater anthropology and cross cultural perspectives on human consciousness. It's a mix that covers a lot of territory, both literally and figuratively. Hillary has traveled the world for research on shamanism and consciousness, and has even managed to stumble into the world of stand up comedy in Berlin. We talk about Western ideas of individualism and how they influence our ideas of being part of a group, how those dynamics function in a place like Peru, and how they all influence our senses of who we really are. We also explore the current cultural ideal of authenticity and how it intersects with enthusiasm and come to a conclusion that might surprise you. Here's my conversation with Hillary Webb. Hillary, welcome to Follow Your Curiosity. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. I'm I'm psyched to hear your story because you do so many cool and amazing sounding things. And so I am going to start with the same question that I always start everybody off with, which is, were you a creative kid or did you discover your creativity later on in life? Oh, wow. Interesting. I guess, you know, this is me being picky. We probably have to discuss what our definitions of creative is my definition is pretty broad <laughs> yeah yeah and i think mine is too um i mean in the sense of i was definitely a daydreamer you know and i was a very shy kid and and i really in a lot of ways preferred the imaginal realm over the, the real world and I, I remember i would just get annoyed when people would you know interrupt me as i was having my little thoughts and fantasies about what might be in this scenario that scenario so, you know, certainly in that way, yeah, I was always in my imagination and coming up with things that uh, either didn't exist or plays on the real world or something like that. And, you know, it did take a concerted effort, I think, for me at one point to go, okay, I need to be a social animal. I need to be in the world with people. And in order to do that, I do need to leave my own head every once in a while and, and check in and connect with people. Yeah, I mean, I I was definitely uh, more than being an athlete or a, or a um, like a scholar when I was in my in grade school. I was a dancer. I loved you know acting and singing and all that, and that was sort of what I in, intended to do with my life at one point. I even went to NYU Tisch, which is the theater arts mm -hmm. school at, at New York University. Spent a year there, decided that I hated it, but I had always loved writing. And I had learned early on, kind of in grade school and high school, that I was best at expressing myself through the written word and that that was a talent I had. So I thought, okay, that's the direction I'm going to go in. At which point I uh, became a journalism major. And then that sort of led from one thing to the other to being an anthropologist. And my creativity at this point is really in the writing that I do that's sort of a hybrid between intellect and emotions. Wow. That's so like, just the idea of the hybrid between intellect and emotion, there is so much packed into that one little phrase. Yeah. And I'm kind of wondering as you're talking, like, because I definitely was a big daydreaming kid too. Um, and it made me wonder, because I know that you went to Goddard like I did, but unlike me, you did not get an MFA in creative writing. You got a degree in consciousness studies. Yes. And I sort of wonder, is there any connection between that whole daydreamy dream world and consciousness studies? And you might need to tell us exactly what consciousness studies is. Too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, this is where it gets, yes, everything does get uh, there. I feel like there's my, my life has actually been very centered for most of it, but there are many spokes uh, and that don't seem like they relate, but they do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so Goddard College is a low residency program in Vermont. And I went there for my master's degree and it was a straight up individualized master's. I actually teach there now, and I'm actually the Conscious Studies coordinator there now. So I did my individual master's with a concentration in consciousness studies. And the way Goddard comes at consciousness studies 
is very broad. So we look at and encourage our students to look at consciousness from the perspectives of, I mean, they can really choose a place to focus, but to have just a little bit of taste of, of the science aspect of it, the artistic aspect of it, the philosophical aspect, the social science aspect of it. So, you know, my main focus has been uh, a psychological anthropology. So my real interest is in going around to different cultures and different cultural groups and saying, how do you conceive of consciousness? This thing that we, we I don't know, how do, how do you even say it? Walk around with? I don't know. This sort of filter we have that uh, through which we understand slash relate to slash engage with the world around us. And depending on what culture you go to, there are very different um, answers about that. So yeah, I mean, really, I, being I was such a daydreamer, I, I think I was very interested at a young age in explorations of consciousness. So much so that at a certain point, I actually scared myself because it suddenly occurred to me that I could get lost in those uh, deep imaginal states and then what will happen to me. So I, for a while, I was actually a little afraid of those states, but gradually kind of weighed, made my way back to uh, just this passion for exploring you know, what are what is our consciousness capable of as human beings? How much can we take in of the world um, when we, for example, expand our perceptual lens? I'm almost afraid to ask this question. Do you have any answers? <laughs> well, I would say more than we ever think and sometimes maybe more than we want to at any given moment. Uh, it's now I'm I'm someone who just for whatever reason kind of loves having my my paradigm shattered. There is something in me that really craves that feeling of having the blinders drawn back and seeing as much of the world, you know, quote unquote purely, although of course we all come in with our own preconceptions, biases, whatever. Mm -hmm. So there's no possible way of seeing the world purely as far as I know. I mean, I, you know, there may well be, but I certainly haven't experienced it. And yeah, yeah. I Could you repeat your question? Because I've actually now <laughs> spun around it's, into it. It's yeah. such an unfair question. I asked you if you found any answers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that is the thing. Uh, there are infinite answers. And there, I, don't, I, I think the answer is that there's very, probably not a lot of likelihood that we're ever going to be, see, be able to see the totality of reality through our consciousness. Unless, of course, that's the last thought we have before we die. Who knows? That could be interesting. But through different methods, there are ways of getting out of what I call our habits of mind, which really trap us in a certain way of thinking about the world and relating to other people. And for me, that's very exciting because it really does open up a whole world of possibilities and tools for engaging with the world. Yeah, it is. It is such an unfair question because it's not like, you know, oh, sure. Here's the answer. E equals MC squared. There you yeah, go. You're done. Right. But I think that it's it's a fascinating thing to try to answer. Even I suspect if you know you're never going to get there. I love questions more than answers. Yeah, I I actually just finished reading Jill Bolte Taylor's book, My Stroke of Insight. And you're kind of reminding me of moments in that book with the whole idea of, okay, your left brain shuts down, your whole consciousness is in your right brain now, and it's so different. And, you know, just exploring that state between the left brain state that we find ourselves in most of the time, where it's go, go, produce, produce, find answers all the time, to, ooh, there are no words here, and everything is peaceful and blissful and beautiful that a lot of us have a really hard time finding. Right. And I'm sure that what you do goes way beyond that. But that's that's just what's occurring to me just because I just finished that book. I was like, wow. Interesting. You know, like yeah. you never think about like what's even going on in your own head. Like if you asked me right now if I was using my left brain or my right brain, I wouldn't really be able to give you an answer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know language is supposed to be on the left side, so I'm sure I'm using at least some left brain, but is there a right in there? I don't know. Yeah. And it's, yeah. you know, it's we fascinating. don't pay attention, but all these things are going on all the time. Yeah, yeah. 
And I haven't, I haven't really looked into what the latest is about left brain, right brain. My last, my last thing I think I heard is that that's not entirely a right accurate in the sense of we don't just use like creative is not just right and right. analytic is not just left, but but it is at least certainly if it's not literal, it's a wonderful metaphor to kind of talk about different states of consciousness, right. sort of the clock system, which is the more analytical quote unquote left side and the, you know, the cloud thinking, which is uh, the more imaginative, creative, quote unquote, right side. Yeah, I've heard that too. And I also remember hearing something a few years ago and then not really hearing anything more about it about the split being more about the top half of your brain and the lower half of your brain, which I really don't know enough to talk about. So I'm not going to try to tell anyone anything about that, except it's an idea I heard once. But fascinating. I don't I don't know a ton about brain research simply because that's not where I, mm -hmm. you know, reside in the field. But it is it is really amazing what what is what discoveries are getting, you know, uncovered as we go along. Very exciting. Yeah. So since you're more in anthropology, how uh, I get the sense that, you know, you got to anthropology from journalism and I'm kind of curious to know what, what that looked like for you. How did that go? Yeah. So backing up again to my early <laughs> life, I grew up in Salem, Massachusetts, which as some people may know is sort of considered the historical site of the Salem witch trials. Mm -hmm. And back then Salem was uh, not quite the uh, Disney world that it is now in terms of that stuff, but very, you know, lots of bookstores that have had stuff on uh, psychic phenomenon, on uh, witchcraft and Wicca and the history of this and that. And that was one of those things that I just became incredibly obsessed with as a child, very interested in. And kind of kept that interest with me as I grew up and, and got older, you know, and like I said, went to the theater school for a little while, then went to journalism and just the journalism, you know, I love, I really enjoyed and have always enjoyed talking to people and finding out what they do in the world and what kind of, uh, you know, thing they get up to, to make meaning of their lives and, and so on. And somewhere after college, probably in my mid 20s, I think it was, somebody introduced me to shamanism, which is very, you know, and this is a very broad umbrella term that essentially is used these days to describe uh, the spiritual practices of indigenous people around the world, basically a shaman being someone who can go into altered states of consciousness in order to attain and gain and use uh, extra natural healing power and knowledge and things like that. And I became really, really fascinated with shamanism because here was in some ways, shamanic journeying, for example, is basically taking a trip through the imaginal realms. Although in shamanism, the imaginal realms are considered very real, as real as the, the world that we're in right now. And I did find that having, I think, had all that time as a kid in, in the imaginal realm, it was, it came very natural to me. And and there's a saying in Peruvian shamanism, which is, can you grow corn with it? Meaning, does a given practice help you become a better person? Does it help you gain knowledge or, or wisdom or information or some kind of thing that you can take to your community and make it better and, and, you know, heal it in some way or, um, and that really appealed to me because I'm a very sort of practical, skeptical person. And by skeptical, I mean, you know, not that I think things are necessarily, um, you know, uh, don't exist, but that I, I like to kind of dig around and see, well, if it's not this, what else could it be besides this? And mm -hmm. So I, I got interested in shamanism and ended up doing, writing a book that was a compilation of. 24 interviews with teachers and writers of shamanism from around the world and eventually got that published as a book eventually was asked by a uh, publishing company to write an introductory book on shamanism and from there I decided you know I, I think I'd like to get some more education I went to Goddard and got my master's degree after that I went to Saybrook University and got a PhD in psychology but my focus really was uh, was anthropology and psychological anthropology because I had some great mentors there who were involved in that field 
So that's kind of the travels, my travels of, of going from journalism to anthropology was, okay, I, I love from, of journalism, this looking at people's stories, but I want to get really, really specific. And I want to go to other cultures that are not my own and learn how else can we engage with the world. That's fantastic. I mean, I'm just imagining getting to go and, and do all of that. And it sounds amazing. So yeah. how, how are you received when you go to all of these places and have these conversations? So far, so good. Uh, <laughs> I've, I mean, I've, I've been very fortunate. Uh, my, I did my doctoral studies in Peru in Cusco, Peru. And I already, from the work I'd been doing in shamanism before, knew a shaman that lives down there. And he was great about taking me around. And uh, the, fo the focus of my study was actually not quite shamanism, but it was looking at the concept of yanantin, which means complementary opposites, as the basically basis of the Peruvian philosophical worldview. So whereas in the Western world, we tend to see the opposites of, ex of existence as being in a constant battle for dominance. In the Peruvian worldview, they are in a dance. They are in a relationship. One cannot exist without the other. So I really went down to say, okay, how, what, what is it like to look at the world from a place of it being a dance rather than a battle? So that ended up being my third book, which was a look at um, this concept of Yanantin and the four stages that they lay out of taking a relationship from one of antagonism to one to complementarity. And so I, like I said, I was just very lucky to find, to know somebody who spoke English, Spanish, and Quechua who could then, you know, take me around the country and introduce me to people and have a lot of conversations. And certainly with his introduction, I was very welcomed. And uh, I recently came out with a book that's actually about stand-up comedy in Berlin. And, you know, there again, you know, open arms. I think people kind of get a kick out of, hey, you like what I'm doing? You think well, something I'm doing has value that's worth looking at and researching and spending money and time to come over here? Yeah, come on. So I've, I've met some incredibly generous people in my travels, for sure. So I have to ask now, what's the connection between shamanism and stand-up comedy in Berlin? Yeah, uh, for me, so I, I uh, for example, my, my Instagram account is titled Tales from the Throne World. And for me, what that means is I, it's sort of an umbrella title for all the work that I do, which is traveling around the world, this quote-unquote throne world that we are thrown into. How are the different, how are people from different places doing different things to get through this absurd, crazy, wonderful, heartbreaking, delicious world that we live in? And, you know, in some ways, there's not a direct connection between the two. But yeah, I just, uh, I, I kind of, uh, I, I go, a lot of my work happens by chance in some ways, or at least certainly the Berlin one project did. I had gone to Berlin simply to go on vacation and see some experimental theater, ended up at this comedy club, saw this, it's all English speaking, but but on the stage that first night, there was somebody from Ireland, from, the, from Iceland, from Croatia, from Sri Lanka, all talking about what it is to be them living in Berlin, you know, traveling the world, doing whatever they're doing, and using comedy as a way of um, you know, expressing their, their lives and having people in the audience uh, from all over the world laughing together, understanding, you know, we're all, now that we've got such a, you know, stronghold through social media, we've all seen the same memes. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of cool to see, whereas humor is usually very specific to a culture you're in. In this case, there was all of us from everywhere uh, who really, you know, in on the joke. So both personally and anthropologically, that really struck something in me, a curiosity. And I thought, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to come back and, and study this phenomenon and see how um, a state of communitas, which means joyful togetherness is evoked night after night 
through uh, bringing a bunch of international strangers together through the the uniting bonding force of laughter. Yeah. And I, I mean, because, so I'm not the expert in consciousness, but I think that laughter is a consciousness changing experience. You know, for one thing, it gets you out of your head, especially, you know, I mean, the kind of laughter where you almost can't stop laughing. And I think, suspect that we've all had at least one experience with that where, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I've had a few where people are like, it's okay, you can stop laughing now. And it's like, no, actually, I can't yet. <laughs> it hasn't let me go. I literally don't know how to stop this. You're gonna have to give me a minute. You know, but that is is a totally different state of existence than what we're usually in. I love that line you just said, it hasn't let me go. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love that because it is how it is and feels. And it's almost this separate force that's kind of, you know, gotcha. And yeah, I mean, in terms of the sort of the consciousness angles, studying communitas or joyful togetherness, it was really the guys at the club were very skillful in bringing us all together as one unit. And they have a bunch of tricks to make that happen. And we go about our lives feeling very singular a lot of the time. I know I talked in the book about being an introvert and walking in alone to this club where people are laughing and joking together, you know, right before the show. And I'm like, all right, well, uh, here I am by myself. And uh, what do I do with my hands? And, uh, hmm. and then the show begins and suddenly I am one of many. Uh, you know, I'm part of a hive a hive mind and in the most beautiful of ways. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, not to paint us all with the same broad brush, but I think we have such an individualist mindset in the Western world and specifically in the United States that I think there can be a resistance to anything that brings us together in such a harmonious way. And that is a, that is a change in consciousness. Yeah. Do you have any, any, I have two questions in my head at the same time. So um, I, I'm kind of wondering like what, what thoughts or observations you have about the fact that we are in the West so individually focused and also like, I think we miss a lot because of that focus. And I'm curious to know, like, what have you noticed that we seem to be missing? And also if you have ideas to help us get there so that we're not missing them. Yeah. Uh, you know, what I see is a lot of fear, again, as I'm saying, you know, of people, uh, many people seem to have a real fear that they're going to get lost in the crowd, that, you know, uh, that if they give themselves in any way over to the group, which, you know, going back to shamanism, things are very much about the group, about how is the work that I'm doing helping the community? I have, so, I actually have some very strong feelings that I've thought about, but maybe never articulated in quite this way. I, I, you know, it, like I said, it makes me sad how afraid people seem to be of the group. And what I learned in Peru is that we don't have to give up our individuality in order to be a member of a community in order to care about the other, even if you don't know the other. This is where I think it goes back to that idea of there is this antagonistic thread going through a lot of the uh, American mindset of what is almost a scarcity. Like if I give myself over to this person or, or this group, what will be taken from me of my identity, of my individuality? When in the Peruvian mindset, you can only be part of the group if you are an individual. You can only serve the group if you are your absolute most truest self. Likewise, you can't become your most authentic true self without the support of the community. So you get to have your cake and eat it too. You get to have, it's both and, it's not either or. And I don't know how we go about adjusting our perceptual lenses when it comes to that. I, I mean, I wish we could, because I honestly, I do think that it's one of the things that will be our downfall. And it's hard for people to get, you can have both. 
it is not just one or the other. Right. And I, you know, I'm thinking of my, some of my own experiences here and your your comment about you can't be your truest self without the support from the community. And I feel like in a lot of cases, both in things that I've experienced and in things that I've seen around me, there's so much pressure to be something that isn't your truest self that you lose track of what that is. And, you know, it's more, no, everybody has to be all this thing. And it it makes me wonder too, you know, going, going back a little bit, you know, if that's like where the fear of the group comes from. And I, I think that certainly in Western culture, we marinate in a whole lot of you must be an individual and do everything yourself. And obviously a lot of it comes from that. But I wonder if some of the fear comes from, but if I want to be part of the group, I have to be just like them and I'm not just like them and I don't want to be just like them and they won't understand me if I don't wear the same clothes, do the same cheers, all of the things that we associate with fitting in and belonging. And it seems almost like a really twisted version of what you saw in Peru. Yeah. Well put. Uh, I think you just said that so beautifully and truthfully. You know, uh, I spend a lot of time in Berlin and I love Berlin because I don't, you know, I'm not, Berlin is not a perfect place either, but in general, being in Berlin and talking to people who live in Berlin, these are mostly people who have come from other parts of the world, many of them Americans. The thing that I hear over over and over again is there's no end game here. You can be whoever you want. If you want to sit at home and watch Netflix, good on you. If you want to go out to the clubs and party till dawn, nice. Tell us all about it. It It is really one of the freest places in that way that I've ever um, been in my many travels around the world. And how we get from one to another, I don't know. Uh, who knows? I mean, I suppose the striving for money in the United States may have something to do with it. In Berlin, you can still live cheaply and you can be your full self because oftentimes your full self doesn't make money and and your creative self, your most creative self does not necessarily make money out of the gate or ever. And yet creativity is so supported in that city. Yeah, I, I don't have any answers. It just uh, it 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 makes me sad, and I think we have a long history to unravel in this country. Yeah, because I've seen that in so many different places where it's very clear that if you're not willing to do whatever the thing is that defines that group, or that someone has decided will f- define that group, and I mean, I've I remember it in elementary school. And it also in workplaces and everywhere in between, it, you know, it's, it's really, it's really rough. It's that whole sense of, I have to take my me shaped, shaped self and fit it into this mold that is not me in order to make all of these other people who are also fitting themselves into a mold that is not them happy. And what and a fucking so, loss. Yeah. What a fucking loss for it's all of twisted. us, frankly. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, really, there's work on the part of the individual to chill out and allow themselves to be part of the group. And there's most definitely, I, uh, the group also needs to recognize that everybody comes in with something wonderful to share. I mean, I'm sure I would imagine have, being an interviewer and doing what you do you get a little something out of every discussion that you have. And mm-hmm. I feel the same way being an interviewer in an anthropological sense. I don't think I have ever had a boring conversation with someone or at least a conversation that I didn't walk away with some new insight. And, and oftentimes those insights come when the person feels heard and seen and free enough to say what their kind of like core enthusiasm is all about. Yeah. I mean, Give me more enthusiasm. If we could... You know, the other, the other day, it was, well, it was a couple of years ago, I was at the cheese counter in this fancy, you know, grocery store. And I was talking to this lady and she was, she was behind the counter, the head of the cheese. <laughs> she was so into cheese. She could talk for hours about cheese. Now, I like cheese. I don't care about cheese that much. <laughs> but I could have watched her talk for hours yeah. about 
why she loves cheese and the different kinds of cheeses. And imagine the world if we all were able to show up and just offer our enthusiasm without worrying about what, how it's going to be received. Because honestly, I think if the right people will, will receive your enthusiasm with such joy and the people who don't, yeah, they're you know, lost. They just don't. Well, and, yeah. and you know, I'm, I'm just putting all of this together as you're talking, but what is occurring to me is there is such a push in our culture right now for everybody to be authentic. But I think that being authentic usually, especially in places like Instagram, means be authentic this way. You know, it's still a mold you have to fit into in order to be perceived as authentic, whether that is what your authenticity is or not. Whereas you're embracing your enthusiasm, I don't think it's really possible to, to be in somebody else's mold when you are in that place where you're just like, let me tell you about this cheese and the cows. And I mean, you won't believe the grass that they eat and everything. And this is where all of this comes, you know? Yeah. And yeah, somebody else could be standing there going, holy cow, lady, you need to get out more, but still be completely entranced yeah. by the fact that you know all of these things, yeah. you know, and yeah. that you're that excited about it. And like, you know, Every every so often, I treat myself to a Doctor Who convention, and I think that's the same kind of thing, right? There is no one in that room who is not totally enthusiastic about this crazy British TV show. And to anyone else, we all, may all look crazy, and maybe we are, but we don't care because we're having fun with this thing that we love. And I, I, I don't know. I feel like the the message should be embrace your enthusiasm. And the authenticity will follow and stop worrying about that part and just do your thing. Bam. Drop the <laughs> mic. I love it. Yes. I I think we should quit right there because what else is there to say after that? You just nailed it. Yeah. I mean, it's true. I think in, in like certain, let's say Instagram culture, I don't mean to pick on Instagram, but you know, authentic, authenticity is held up like this badge of honor. And again, I do think it's sort of like, equates with individuality. See, I'm being authentic. I'm being my individual self. Do you love me now? Yeah. How many likes am I getting? Um, but I love what you just said. Let's, rather than authenticity, which we're always, I think, uncovering until the day we die, let's go from where is your enthusiasm right now? What's, uh, what's floating your boat? Yeah, what's um, exciting you? Yeah, yeah. Who's your favorite doctor? <laughs> Mine's Tom Baker. I grew, I grew up with Tom Baker <laughs> and, and the scarf. A lot of us grew up with Tom Baker, right? But yeah. and, and I love Tom Baker. I really do. But I feel like he's everybody's favorite doctor. And mm. I, I was watching him and Peter Davison at the same time. And I'm not going to lie. I was, you know, a 14-year-old girl. Peter Davison won. Um, nice. But really, you know, beyond that, I, I can't get it down below four, four, <laughs> four favorites. It's yeah. it's Peter Davison, Paul McGann, Matt Smith, and Peter Cabaldi. Nice, that's, nice. That's it. Yeah. With a healthy honorable mention for everybody else because I love them all. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, I am. I, I feel like that that should be that should be where we're operating from. Yeah. Do you see that more when you go to a place like Peru? Ooh, no, I can't say no, uh, no, but there is something intimate about enthusiasm. It's not something you necessarily, I think anywhere we come from, share with somebody you just met. I think, yeah, I think there is an intimacy that goes along with enthusiasm. And while, you know, there have been times when I've certainly got close enough to people to see a little bit about that. I wouldn't say that I'm seeing it in people's eyes every moment of the day where I do love to see it actually. And going back to our Goddard connection is working with my students at Goddard college mm -hmm. because Goddard in the, at least in the master's program that I work in really allows 
students to come in with something they love. What is the topic you love? Because we don't teach classes. It's a it's an advising mentoring methodology. So I'll work with, you know, three or five students per semester, more or less. And each one will come in with very different topics of study. And one of the things that I love about my job is talking with the students about what they're doing. And often it's a little bit of fumbling around in the dark, trying to figure out where's the door, where's the light, where's, where's it that I'm trying to get to. Um, and as soon as, you know, but sometimes during the course of our conversation, a light will just in their eyes. And I'm like, okay, that, that is your enthusiasm. And sometimes they don't even know that that was what they were enthusiastic about. Or maybe they knew, but they didn't think that it was worth anything because sometimes, yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the odd thing. Sometimes the, we think the things that are most exciting to us are the, the most worthless somehow, because I, I love this too much. It's fun. How could it be my calling if it's fun? Yeah. And I feel like we could probably talk more about that idea of what what's worth something and what isn't, because I think just the fact that something lights you up by definition means it's worth something, even if it's only worth something to you and odds are good, it's not just you. Right. The way that we tend to discount things as being unworthy because we think they're silly or or whatever, yeah. you know, I think I think maybe we're miscalibrated on the worth scale here, too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also. You know, and and again, not to uh, uh, paint all uh, upper higher education with a broad brush, but a lot of traditional academic situations, it's uh, let's find the thing that interests you and make it as boring as possible. And let's totally, uh, you know, kill any emotional component you have with it. Let's find the facts and figures and you know, give me the driest uh, master's dissertation you can and you'll pass. And so I think that often we get into this mindset of if it's fun and it or it raises emotions in me, it can't be serious. So at Goddard, we pretty much insist that students look at their topic, whatever it is, from the three this sort of three-pronged knowledge, which is the knowing, the sort of intellectual, you know, facts, figures, debates, so on and so forth, the being, what does this particular subject have to do with you and your life? And why is it exciting to you? Why is it important to you? What, what is this that's motivating you to, to work on this subject? And the doing of, okay, so now you've got knowledge about this from knowing and being, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to bring it out in your community in some way? And this does not, again, doesn't have to be a grandiose thing, but how are you going to bring it out and help address a problem? And again, I think it's easy to think it has to be a big problem. It has to be, I want to change the world. And, you know, forget about changing the world. Just change your own little corner of it. And it can be as little as possible. Just change, change your attitude when you're driving down the street. Anything. Yeah, I yeah. think changing the world is is a monumental task and we never stop to think about the effects of the smaller things that can contribute to changes in the world because again we devalue those we think that only scaling mount everest is important whereas if you've never scaled a mountain you might want to start with that little hill down the street first and see how that goes and mm -hmm. go on yeah. to the the bigger hill and then the small mountain and yeah yeah and the only way, again, this goes back to community, the only way we can, quote unquote, change the world. And even that, I just I, I kind of hate that statement because parts of the world are not ours to change. So the only way we're going to make the changes we want to see in the part of the world that that we feel drawn to are with others because we cannot do it on our own. We can't do it on our own. This is where others have to come in and we yeah. combine our efforts and so on and so forth. And the only way the world, quote unquote, changes is by little things, by little steps. And that's what stops the world, I think, from being changed is that people go, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know how to change the world. Well, change your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's the same thing that stops people in their creative projects. Yeah. You know, you look at it as I want to write this huge, important novel and I can feel how important it is. And you get so hung up on that, that 
it's so overwhelming. You can't get yourself to start. Yeah. It's not the only thing that people get hung up on, but it's a, it's a big one. Right. You know, when it's like, why don't you just sit down and write a paragraph or Precisely. maybe a sentence or two, yeah. you know, and see how that goes. And if you want to write another sentence or two or another two paragraphs, go for it, but don't make it. I am going to do this thing and I'm going to do it tomorrow. You'll never sit down to do it. Exactly. Exactly. We got to get out of that. I got to be the best, biggest, you know, most impactful thing that's ever been created. And um, yeah. 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 And I have to say, you know, in thinking about the idea that you need others to support you in order to really be who you are, Goddard is, is one of the, maybe the only place that I've ever been and I never thought about it until right this minute, but you know, we were not, we were not told that we had to make ourselves into this mold of the writer. You know, I mean, you hear about MFA programs where people go into workshop something and the whole goal is to see who's still standing at the end when everyone else is drowning in a pool of their own emotional blood. And Goddard was not like that at all. And I know that that was a point of pride among the faculty at Goddard because, you know, like, why are, why are you here if we're going to slice you and dice you and turn you into something you're not? And at some point when I was in that program and I finished in 2009, I read an article about how all of these MFA programs are turning out people who, you know, you pick up a random literary journal and everything reads like it's the same thing. Because this workshop approach means you're catering so much to everybody else that you're losing everything that makes you unique. And so you read through this journal and it's like, wow, those were 10 stories that were all pretty much the same. Wow. Interesting. Scary. Yeah. Sad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I mean, you had a good experience at Goddard because I do think it's, that is the, that is the goal is do something different. Yeah. And I think I've been thinking that we should probably explain a little bit how not teaching classes works because anybody who's listening to this who's never heard about Goddard or a school like it is probably going, I'm sorry, then how do you do a degree yeah. there? <laughs> Good point. Good point. <laughs> we haven't totally lost everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so in the uh, Goddard Graduate Institute where I teach, it basically works like this. There, it, you know, typically four semesters, although some students go for five or more. But within those four semesters, a student, let's say, in their first semester will come in with an idea, just something they're interested in exploring. And so they, during their first year, they'll get put with uh, a faculty advisor. And the first semester is very often, you know, playing around with ideas. So in general, we have a packet set up. So every, let's say, three weeks, uh, the student will send, say, you know, 25 pages of writing um, to me, and that's five packets per semester. But also there's, you know, if a student isn't a writer or doesn't like writing or doesn't feel like a certain kind of writing is not their thing, all right, well, what what else or how else can you communicate what you're learning about a given subject? Can you do a film? Can you do some artwork and then maybe a little short written process paper? It's very open in terms of how ideas get expressed. So yeah, so in the first semester, it's a lot of exploration. It's a lot of throwing spaghetti at the wall. It's a lot of, you know, all over the place. Through the second, third semester, that all gets whittled down to, okay, what of your, what you're studying? What's the core thread? What are you looking at? Um, okay, this semester, let's focus on this. And of course, I'm not telling them what, although I am guiding them in terms of the requirements, because although it's very free, we do have certain requirements at Goddard. So, and Really, the idea is from the first semester through the fourth semester is all building towards the final product. And that might be a 150-page written dissertation. It could be a film with a 50-page process paper. It could be an artistic thing. It's very, very open. So there's a lot of flexibility depending on what kind of learner you are and what your, well, ultimately what your goals are. Um, yeah. So it's fun. And it's never boring for me as an instructor. I'm sure. Yeah. 
I'm sure it certainly was never boring for me as a student. And, and I think, you know, I'm sure that it's the same in your program as it was in mine, where this is all highly self-directed. It's, I'm curious about this and I want to know more about this part of it. And, you know, or like with the writing program, like I'm trying to figure out more about how myth works because I want to use myth in my thesis. And so I think this semester, that's what I want to focus on. And then somebody like Rachel Pollock, who was one of my advisors, sits down and says, great. And the books that you've picked are great, but you should also think about these. So let's put these on your list and whittle it down. And and that's your semester. It's kind of a, a co-created thing with your advisor. And then in those letters that go back and forth, because we had to do a process letter in every packet, and I'd write I don't know, three or four pages, whatever it was about, here's what's going on, everything from, so my grandmother is dying right now as I'm trying to do all of this, to I'm struggling with this part, but I feel really good with, about this other thing. And then, you know, we'd get a letter back that was, sorry about your grandmother, let me know if you need help. And, you know, yeah, I think you're right that this is working really well, but you might want to look at these three things about this other part, you know, so it was, it was a consistent dialogue the whole time. And that, that's how it all works without classes. It's a one-on-one. -on -one. I hadn't thought of it in terms of mentoring exactly, but that's a really good word. It's like yeah. that that relationship is part of it. It's not just, oh yeah, I have Professor Smith's class and we have an exam on Thursday. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, very well explained. Very similar in terms of the, the uh, Graduate Institute program as well. And we're, I think there's, what do we have? Eight advisors and uh, we're all, generalists, quote unquote, meaning, you know, we can more or less work with anybody doing anything because in some ways our job is to be the, the reader, like, okay, I don't understand this. Sometimes it's good to be with somebody mm -hmm. who doesn't know anything about your field because it's like, all right, I don't understand what this means. You're losing me. If your audience is, is somebody who isn't necessarily a, uh, an expert in this, you're going to need to clarify this. On the other hand, I typically, you know, because I'm the consciousness studies person, I usually will end up with the students who I have some knowledge about their field, like psychedelics or, um, you know, uh, anthropological work or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing how different everyone's experience is going through that program. I and mean, you think if you, if you, come out of a Goddard program and you have a thesis that looks even remotely like someone else's, you've probably done something wrong. <laughs> it's true. It's as much true. as you can do anything wrong at Goddard in that way. I mean, you can yeah. fail out. You can have an unsuccessful semester. Don't get us wrong. Yeah. But but yeah, I think the odds of, of churning out something similar to what somebody else has done have to be really, really small. Really small. Yeah. Even people, I mean, I've had students working on the same subject matter just end up with very, in very different places. And they're, they're all right. I mean, it's like, there's no, there's, I'm not going to say there's no wrong, but uh, the, the field is there to explore, not to, uh, I mean, you do need to uh, convince me, but, but the field is very open for like exploration about what that convincing looks like. Yeah, which gets back to the whole enthusiasm and doing your own thing. Yeah. Which I think is the magic of Goddard. You have the freedom to do that and you wouldn't yeah. almost anywhere else. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, you know, I have to say I kind of sort of hated school up until I got my master's degree. I almost couldn't believe that I went back to get my, you know, my master's mm -hmm. degree. But uh, doing it that way, because I just basically hate being told what to do in terms of like, you, you need to take these classes and these electives. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's that mold it's, again. Yes, you know? exactly. You have to be these things. Right. You have right. to do these things and be these things to prove that you're good enough to get to do the things that you want to do. Exactly. Madness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you've got me thinking so much about like our own sense of worthiness and how tied it is to what other people think worthiness is as opposed to what what we actually find in ourselves and what we want to explore and what we want to create. And honestly, I mean, this is all feeling incredibly tragic to me because I don't think it should be this way. I agree. But the good news is that you, me, all of us 
uh, we are enthusiastic about something. Sometimes it's buried under layers of abuse, whether that's by other people or ourselves. We all have something that we love and are so excited about. And not everybody's going to get it at all. Um, but that's okay, because that's how we know who our people are. It's those. That's the magnet. You know, that's that you, how so you find your, your, your tribe. That's how that you find is, your community. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. That's where the magic is. Yeah. 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 And the work is getting past all those layers of whatever it is that we pour cement that we pour on top of our enthusiasm in order to feel like we can get through life without feeling stupid or, uh, you know, inadequate or, or, or. Yeah. And I, I'm wondering right now how many people will listen to this and for the very first time realize that that's what they've done. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I don't want to say we've all done it, but certainly I feel like somebody who lets my enthusiasm out regularly and I'm sure there are other, there are more layers I could go even deeper mm -hmm. after, and probably we'll start thinking about that after our talk. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have been wondering one thing, actually, I've probably been wondering many things, but the one that keeps <laughs> popping up into my head is when you were in Berlin and you went to the comedy club, was it like an open mic kind of thing? Did you get a chance to get up and give it a whirl? No, because I don't want to. I'm not okay. enthusiastic about it. It's so, so funny. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like I said, I, I recently published a book about my experiences in Berlin. And while I was shopping it around, I got, you know, I, I, I talked to an agent and she actually didn't um, read it, but I was telling her the story. And she's like, well, wouldn't it be a better story if you ended up getting up on stage? And I just was like, ugh, next. You know, <laughs> I'm like, no, because that's not the point. And, you know, part of the point is I love in that situation, I love being in the audience. I, I want to be a professional audience member, which I sort of am as an anthropologist. I, I have no interest in being up on stage. And again, it's that sort of your only your enthusiasm is only meaningful if you get up on stage and decide to do it is what I felt like she was saying to me in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I sort of like, when I, you know, <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't I don't really have any interest in getting up on stage, but I love to watch. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point. You know, having enthusiasm for something doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you love car racing, that doesn't mean you have to be the driver. Mm -hmm. You can love it as an experience when you go to a race and watch someone else do it. Just mm -hmm. like, you know, there's a a story I remember hearing about my grandmother and her mother, you know, going to a, a choir event, lots of choir singers in my family. And my great grandmother was one of them. And one time she was not in physical shape to participate and sat in the audience with my grandmother. And my grandmother said to her, now, didn't you enjoy that? And my great grandmother said, no, I'd much rather be up there. <laughs> Whereas my grandmother yeah. had no desire to get up and sing in the choir. She wanted to just sit and listen. Right. And then they're both totally valid ways to approach things. Yeah. And I would ar even argue in a way, although it's a little bit of a mind twist kind of thing, that by sitting in the audience, I am doing comedy. I'm doing my part of the comedy ecosystem. I am being right. the receiver and the enthusiastic, I mean, especially in stand-up comedy. I think in all theater and all performance, there's an aspect of this very much so, but it's just so overt in stand-up comedy where the audience really is part of the show because the comedian is looking at the audience member yeah. and they are totally playing off. And sometimes the audience members are, you know, hooting or, you know, or, you know in the, not so much at the, the comedy club that I was at, but being inappropriate or heckling or whatever. Mm -hmm. It is, it is a energetic and verbal dialogue at every moment. And you couldn't have yeah. comedy, the stand-up comedy without the audience. Absolutely. And, you yeah. know, it's been a while since I've done community theater, but I remember the same thing. You know, some nights you really got a lot of energy from the audience and it was great and everything just kind of flows. But the nights when the audience seems like it's half checked out, you're just sitting there going, 
give me something. Yeah. Come on. I need yeah. something to play off of. And it's much harder. Yeah. And isn't it interesting? It's probably so subtle as well. Like, how do you know as a performer when they're checked out and when they're, I mean, I suppose there can be some verbal cues. You know, how do you, how do you, how do you feel that? And I find that again, talking about sort of consciousness in some way, your consciousness to the audience's consciousness is all linked up and you kind of have a, you can feel what's going on. You know, Mm -hmm. when, you know, it's like, you know, testing the wind, you know, when things are, the wind's coming from a certain direction with the audience. Yeah. Cause you know how it feels. You can just kind of feel it like, like you can tell the hot and cold in the air. You can sort of feel it in your skin and you're just kind of sitting there going, Ooh, Ooh, something's weird out there tonight. And I don't know what it is. And I'm going to do my best, but right. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I have absolutely loved this conversation. I am so glad that we made sure that we did it. And I'm very curious to see what kinds of things you come up with next, because I think that all of this is fascinating stuff. Oh, well, this has been so much fun for me. You ask great questions. I love the, uh, you've, I love conversations like this because you ask questions I probably wouldn't have ever thought to ask myself and I will be thinking about for probably weeks and months and years after this. Um, So this has been a blast and it's also nice to see a fellow Goddard alum. Agreed. So yeah, yeah. So thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. That's our show for this week. My deep gratitude to my guest, Hillary Webb, and to you. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review and in it, Tell us something you're enthusiastic about, whether it's large or small. And please do share this episode with a friend. It really helps the show find new listeners. Thanks so much. You know, I talk to people all the time who are feeling totally lost, overwhelmed, and stuck creatively. And I know there are lots more of you out there who are feeling the same way. So I made something to help. Check out the link in your podcast app for my creative tune-up kit. 37 bucks, super affordable, and it's full of my favorite coaching tools to help you rediscover your creative self and make progress fast. I would love to get it into your hands so that you can get unstuck and create beautiful things this year. Follow Your Curiosity is produced by me, Nancy Norbeck, with music by Joseph McDade. If you like Follow Your Curiosity, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to tell your friends. It really helps me reach new listeners. 